we were just thanking and praising God for our families just now, I just want to say to those who haven't a family here, and for those who haven't a family anywhere, that we are one another's family, that we here as the body of Christ are brothers and sisters. And whilst we affirm and endorse our own families and our blood relations and give God the praise for those and build those up and affirm them, we also endorse one another as a family of believers, as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus. So there is to be no loneliness, no isolation, there are no outsiders in the body of Christ because we're one. But I'm not here to give you a sermon, I'm here to introduce Clive, who's going to give you a sermon. And it's actually quite daft asking anybody to introduce Clive, because most of you kind of know Clive already. But I want to say three things um, that you might not know. One is that Clive is an avid golfer. Put your hands up if you knew that. Oh, egg. <laughs> the second thing, is that Clive began his public speaking as a Liberal Party agent in the East End of London. Put your hands up if you knew that. Oh, smug. <laughs> All right, the third thing then, Clive never wears jeans. Put your hands up if you knew that. <laughs> ah, I've got you there. Well, we might find out where, why he doesn't wear jeans, but I don't think it will form part of his sermon tonight. I've known Clive many years now, I'm on the Council of Management for the Evangelical Alliance, which he served as the General Director for 10 or more years. He's been a fantastic director. His vision, his determination, his single-mindedness, his desire to serve God has actually steered the EA through a very interesting and fantastic period. Clive has actually been unswerving in his commitment to the evangelical faith. It's interesting, I have a friend, um, a high up friend in the Church of England, who said he's always been against the establishment. And one day he woke up and realized he was the establishment. <laughs> now Clive could wake up tomorrow and realize he too is the establishment. Because here he is, heading up a massive organization like the Evangelical Alliance. But Clive, is never going to be an establishment person. Clive is very much his own person. Clive is God's person. Clive will stand out against any opinion that veers from scripture. And we can be enormously grateful to God for Clive in that way. Clive too, very recently, has actually steered the Evangelical Alliance into a new visionary project with Whitfield House. In the middle of a ginormous recession, he has managed to inspire people to raise over a million pounds towards making this Whitfield House a base, a permanent base for the EA. That's fantastic. And it shows the respect, the dignity that people give him and the trust they have in his leadership. There's still more money to be raised for Whitfield House. I'm convinced that God wants it there and that it will come in. But I tell you this story just to tell you a little bit about Clive's leadership, Clive's vision, Clive the person, and soon you hear about Clive the preacher. One final thing that I really is fan think is fantastic about Clive is that he's married to Ruth. <laughs> Give him a big hand. Thank you very much indeed. I want to share with you from Mark chapter 8 tonight and those verses that Gilbert read to us. But I want to do so with uh, a sense of a heavy heart and uh, a sense of trepidation as well. Because I believe that we're living in increasingly important and significant times. I want to catch hold of what Alex just shared. We've got to recover the centrality of Jesus before it's too late. We've got to make Christ at the centre of all things before we lose the very vitality and fibre of our faith. 
About three months ago, four months ago, I had the opportunity of going to Israel. I'd had nearly 10 years as a director of EA, and uh, the opportunity was given me to go to Israel for seven days and just kick leaves, just to see God and wait on God. It's not the sort of opportunity that you would normally get. And a friend of mine, who's formerly uh, the vice chairman of Spring Harvest, agreed to come with me and keep me out of mischief. And uh, he is a rather cautious brother. He's just like me, in fact, very, very laid back. And he's so cautious, whereas I tend to be very outgoing. And he would never take an impetuous decision in his life. And Brian is very conservative, very solid, very determined, and he's also a great friend. And we went out to Israel together, and. Uh, Brian had never been before, and I had, and one day he said, can we go somewhere and have a look at something? And so we went over to Mount Carmel. We looked at the kind of caves in which Elijah had taken refuge. When we were trying to drive back, we lost our way. I was navigating. <laughs> and we got completely lost. And we finally got to the point where Brian insisted we stopped and asked someone. Now that is totally against all my principles, but we stopped and we asked someone what was the way. And we found the only Australian Israeli in the country. <laughs> and this lady said, well, go down this road and the third lane on the left, turn right. You're a long way away from where you want to get to. But what you need to do is take the third lane on the right, and if you do that, it's the locals route. You just follow that lane, drive along that lane, and in the end you'll come out on the road that you're after. So off we set. Brian, in traditional fashion, said, are you sure she's got it right? I said, she's Australian. She must have it right. So we, we went down to the third lane on the right, and we were driving a little Subaru, tiny little white car. And we started driving along this lane, and it began to get potholed, and the car started to shake a bit. We drove another mile, and the car was really shaky. And Brian, by this time, is saying, are we on the right road? Shall we go back? Now, I don't believe in ever going back anywhere. And the problem was, trying to reverse back to those potholes would have been a nightmare. So I said, come on, let, let's keep going. So we went on another mile, and by this time, the potholes were extreme, and we're really shaking our way through. And Brian is saying, we've got to go back. And I'm saying, where are you going to turn? He said, I can't, we can reverse. I said, reverse back three miles through that lot, you'll never make it. He said, all right, we'll go on. So we went on another half mile, and that's when we came to the cattle grid. <laughs> well, half a cattle grid. Because <laughs> it was broken. And so I got out to examine the situation, and so did Brian. He said, we'll never get over it. I said, well, how are you going to get back? He said, we can't, and it's getting towards nightfall. I said, well, we've got, to go to, we've got to go over it then. Brian said, we can't go over it, it's broken. I said, well, what you do, Brian, is you draw the car back about 10 yards, <laughs> accelerate for all your worth, let in the clutch, shoot forward, and with luck, you'll get over the first half of the grid, because it's the second half that was broken, and you'll then rise in the air, go straight across and you'll land on the other side. <laughs> Brian did not look very convinced at that moment. He, I said, all right, I'll get behind you and I'll shove while you're driving forwards. So, in the end, after some careful deliberation together, we agreed that's what we'd try. So Brian got in the car, revved up the engine, having reversed it back, started to go forwards with me shoving, got onto the cattle grid, shooting forwards, went to the end of the cattle grid, instead of rising in the air, went down, but managed to get out the other ends, screeching around, scrubbing around, finally the car got out, and we were through. And it was then we saw the signs that said, danger, military firing range. <laughs> now, at this moment, there wasn't much we could do about it, because there was no way we'd ever get back. So we started to drive on, still very pothole. We got to another mile, and then, then there's more signs. Extreme danger, military firing range, firing in progress. 
So we had another mile shaking off, and that was when we finally saw the Israeli army. <laughs> well, one platoon of it. And they looked in amazement at this little white car shuddering its way up this lane. One of the soldiers came up to us and he said, Where did you come from? We said, From back there. He said, Didn't you hear the see feel the shells? We said, Well, we did hear some bangs. He said, Well, you're ever so lucky to have got through. You, you can keep going now. You're past it. We went on another mile and um, that's when we met the tank <laughs> that had been firing at us. <laughs> I've never ever believed in going back. And I believe that in God, we've got to go forward. I don't believe that now there's any going back from what God has done in the last 20 years in this nation, in his church. And I want you to recognize that the 20th century, the last quarter of the 20th century has been the rebirth of evangelicalism in this nation. It has been the moment that we've begun to recover the fire and the power that once we had in this land. And I would like to suggest that evangelicalism is like a table with four legs. A friend of mine says it used to be like a pedestal table with one leg and that was doctrine. Nowadays I think it's got four legs. But I believe that only three of them are properly in place. And unless you go forward and get the fourth one in place, you know what happens with tables with three legs when you put things on them? In the end they collapse. And I believe the first leg that we recovered was personal spiritual renewal. When we began to sense God moving in the hearts and lives of his people by his Holy Spirit with power. And that personal spiritual renewal, which has seen the re-innovation of worship and of prayer within this nation, that has been the first leg. The second leg has been the beginnings of a recovery of that social commitment and social concern that has distinguished evangelicalism in its heritage. You've only got to look at 18th and 19th century evangelicalism and you can see a commitment to social passion and concern. People like Bernardo and Muller with their orphanages, those who built leper colonies and staffed them, those like Shaftesbury who saw the hours and conditions of work for women and children changed by parliamentary legislation, General Booth with the first employment exchanges. Bramwell Booth with the campaign against child prostitution on the streets of London and supremely Wilberforce and the battle against slavery. And that's the second leg of evangelicalism we've begun to recover. It. And the third leg has been evangelism and church planting. And with the Dawn Conference recently announcing that 20,000 churches needed to be planted in this country over the next few years, I mean, that does give difficulty to some. The suggestion that in every area, there's one church needed for every 2,000 people. My friend Arvin Jones, who's the General Secretary of the Welsh Evangelical Alliance, was very concerned to hear there needed to be one church or chapel for every 2,000 people in the population. He figured that meant he needed to close down one chapel every week for the next three years. <laughs> but there's a recovery of a commitment to evangelism, a recovery of a commitment to church planting. And those are three legs. But there's a fourth leg, on top of spiritual renewal, social responsibility, evangelism and church planting. The fourth leg of evangelicalism is a commitment to doctrine. It's a commitment to knowing in our hearts and lives who Jesus is. It's a commitment to the centrality of Christ. When I went through theological college and, and did my degree in theology, when so many of the speakers here did, the one offering that we were given by the university examining boards was liberal theology. Starting from the position that Jesus was not the Son of God and the Bible was not the Word of God and proceeding on from there. And if evangelicalism is to regain its vitality fully and really to see all that God wants to do among all our myriad denominations, it is only going to be when we recover a commitment to truth as Jesus said it and as Scripture reveals it. I believe it's time to let the Spirit of God blow away the cobwebs of uncertainty and introduce a fresh breath of spiritual conviction within our nation. Of course, as soon as you start to speak like that, it's very, very unpopular. 
because we're all brought up to tolerate everything. And to dare to suggest that there are some things we shouldn't tolerate is very unacceptable in our society. It was about six years ago that Ruth and I with the children were down at a, a conference in Cornwall. And I have to confess, I know this doesn't happen to other members of our speaker team, but it happened to me. I wasn't quite fully prepared for the next day. And so what I did was, I agreed with Ruth, we'd go down to the beach and we found a little Cornish cove with nobody there at all. And I settled Ruth and the children down under the cliffs, the scrubland above them. And I went to the other side of the beach, as far away as I could get, left Ruth to handle the four children, <laughs> and I turned to the book of First Kings. After about a quarter of an hour, my oldest daughter, Vicky, came running up and said, Daddy, 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 come quickly, Daddy, come quickly, Daddy. So Daddy came quickly to find out what was wrong. And apparently it had been Vicky who had spotted it first. You see, our little daughter, Susie, who was then 18 months old, was doing what every 18-month-old child does on her first encounter with sand, which is... And as Susie is eating sand, Vicky had spotted it. She said, Mommy, Mommy, look at the lovely golden worm playing in the sand with Susie. And Ruth went to look and saw this beautiful golden worm, three feet from her baby, with its lovely crisscross pattern up its back, the little V on its head. And so she got the only blunt instrument in sight, which was a child's plastic spade. She got it underneath the snake, she got the adder a few feet away from her baby, and then she hammered and hammered and hammered at its head, and she hammered at its body till it was splattered in the sand, and then being a good Christian, she buried the snake. <laughs> and now the problem is you're feeling sorry for the snake. But the snake could have killed the baby. And the results of the 18th century enlightenment the results of the rationalism that has ruled in this country for so long, the results of 20th century existentialist thought, the result of liberal theology and doubting clergy has created a situation where, as Oscar Wilde said, we're fed up with St. Thomas being the favourite apostle and doubt reigning at the altar. And if we do not rise up again and proclaim truth as it truly is, then evangelicalism will never recover. Because unless it is based firmly on the centrality of Jesus, there's nothing to base it on. And so I want to say five things tonight all based on this one phrase, when you know who Jesus is. And I want to base them on Mark chapter 8 and chapter 9. That lovely moment when Jesus is there with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi. And I want to say firstly, when you know who Jesus is, you'll be at the crossroads of your life. When you know who Jesus is, you'll be at the crossroads of your life. Caesarea Philippi was a strange place to be. It's right up there in the north of Israel. There's very little there nowadays except the reservoirs and everything. Because Caesarea Philippi is where the River Jordan really starts and just comes out of the rock. And for that reason, way before Jesus' time, the Canaanites had called it Balias. Because they saw it as being a, a place of religion, a place of mystery, a place of fertility. When the Greeks came on the scene, they called it Panias, after the god Pan. The Israelites had called it Dan. You remember the phrases in scripture, from Dan in the south, at the north, to Bathsheba in the south. And in Jesus' day, the Roman governor had called it Caesarea, after the Caesar god, the emperor god, who the Romans worshipped. And he'd added his own name on it too, to get a bit of notoriety and distinguish it from Caesarea on the coast. And so it was called Caesarea Philippi. It had always been a place of mystique. It had always been a place of religious interest and inquiry. It had always been a place connected with religion. And Jesus took his disciples there. And I believe that outside of Galilee and outside of Jerusalem, it is probably the most significant place in the Gospels because it was there, at that place, traditionally connected with religion, that Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, Who do people say I am? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, some say one of the prophets. 
Jesus then did something very significant. He said, who do you say that I am? Because at the end of the day, it's not who the speakers say Jesus is. It's not who our pastors and vicars say Jesus is. It's not even who our parents say Jesus is. It's who do we say he is. And he turns it on his disciples. He says, who do you say I am? Once they had said what they thought through the mouth of Peter, their spokesperson, everything changes in Mark's gospel. Everything changes in each of the gospel records. Up to Caesarea Philippi, well, all the emphasis is on the parables and the miracles, but afterwards, all the emphasis is on the trip to Jerusalem and what happened there. Up to that point, well, all the emphasis is on the kingdom of God. From that point on, all the emphasis is on the Son of Man. Up to that point, it's all very bright. After that point, it's all getting dark. The bulk of Jesus' ministry preceded Caesarea Philippi. And yet half the gospel records concentrate on the last few days. Because Caesarea Philippi is the crossroads in the gospels. After that, everything changes. Caesarea Philippi was the crossroads for Jesus. After that, he's on the way to a cross. Nothing's ever going to be the same again after Caesarea Philippi. And when you face the question, who do you say Jesus is? Nothing is ever the same again. Once you recognize who he is, the Son of God and King of Kings and Lord of Lords, nothing can be the same again. Once you face the question, who is Jesus? Whichever way you respond, life's never quite the same because that's the crossroads of life. Secondly, when you know who Jesus is, you'll know something that it took Simon Peter two years to realize. You'll know that he is the Christ. Peter says, you are the Christ. And I want you to recognize what the most important word is in that phrase. It's not Christ. It's not you. It's not even our. The most important word is the definite article. It's the. See, nowadays we're very happy to say Jesus is a Christ. Nowadays our modern society is very happy to say Jesus is one Christ among many. The one thing no one is prepared to acknowledge is that he is the Christ. He is the one and only Christ. Without him there is no other Christ. And the problem with our society today is this, that Jesus is reduced to the level of one of the prophets. He is reduced to the level of the reincarnation of one of the old great saints of old. He is not acknowledged for who he is. The one phrase you cannot preach on in today's society is when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to Father but through me. He can be a way. He can be a truth. He can be a life. But he's never allowed to be the way, the truth, and the life. And Peter doesn't say you're a Christ. He says you're the Christ. Our modern existentialism, that code word that we have for modern thought, which refers to the way that so many people see themselves as just a blank piece of paper on which their experiences have written. That leads people to say, well, each one of us is different, so each one of us has different truth. If you go and experiment with homosexuality and it works for you, our existentialist society says that becomes truth for you. If you go and play around with sleeping around with people and it works for you, our existentialist society says that becomes truth for you. If you want a nuclear family of 2.4 children and one wife and that works for you, that becomes truth for you, says our existentialist society. But no individual way is better than another one because there is no such thing as the truth, there's only a truth. And a truth is what you experience for yourself. So truth is only what you experience. There is none of what Francis Schaeffer termed true truth, absolute truth that governs all things. And so our modern society says, you can go and find a Christ through Marx, or a Christ 
through Buddha or a Christ through Muhammad or a Christ through Jesus. And our modern world's not too worried about you going to church. It's not too worried about you following Jesus, providing you never ever say that others have got to do that. And our modern society is thrilled when an evangelist stands up and says, if you want a better way of life, come to Jesus. Or if an evangelist stands up and gives his or her testimony and then says, this Jesus who I found could be yours. Because they can equally easily say, no thank you. There is a preaching of the gospel that Jesus gave that we're not allowed to give today. And that preaching of the gospel isn't that Jesus is a better way, because he never said he was a better way. He said he's the only way. And you're not allowed to say that nowadays because you're saying something. You're not saying Jesus is a way or a Christ. You're saying Jesus is the way and the Christ. And that by inference means everybody else is wrong. And that plurality of views, that pluralism, has infected the whole of our society. If you think I'm talking high polluting philosophy, turn on EastEnders. Read the Daily Mirror. Listen to your radio. That's accepted as norm. There is no absolute truth. All truth is relative, we're told. All truth is relative. You pay your money, you take your choice. One gets to God through Jesus, one gets to God through themselves, one gets to God through Muhammad. One chooses one sexual orientation, another chooses another. You choose that which you would want. Scripture does not give you that kind of option. If I go out of here tonight, my car runs on diesel. If I go down to the petrol station and fill it up with petrol, not diesel, what is going to happen to my motor? It's going to stop. The world says that evangelicals say that AIDS is the judgment of God. I don't believe AIDS is the judgment of God. If my car breaks down and stops because I filled it up with diesel, uh, with petrol, not diesel, is that the judgment of God on me for having a Renault? <laughs> is that the judgment of God on me for having a diesel? No, of course it's not. It's my own stupid human stupidity for disobeying the maker's instructions and failing to read the handbook properly. And we were given sexuality as a gift from God to be loved and enjoyed in a monogamous relationship within marriage. And if you break God's intention and ignore his handbook and misuse his gift, then he doesn't make a nasty arbitrary sideswipe to bash out because he's fed up with you for disobeying him. There are logical consequences of human stupidity. And the logical consequence in one generation was syphilis, in another it was gonorrhea, in another it was herpes, and today it is AIDS. And the tragedy of disobeying and going against that which God has designed and failing to use his gifts in the way that he wants is that our human stupidity leads to, to the fact that others suffer too. And the awful abomination of people contracting AIDS through blood transfusion, etc created by the way that people have failed to obey the Maker's instructions. The way we've failed to recognize His gifts. And that's why I stand with the work of Care Trust and others in their attempt to proclaim the fact that Christian moral standards are not an option. And that this book is not God's word for Christians. It is God's revelation of Himself for the whole of humankind. It is not limited to us, it is for all humankind. And therefore the ultimate responsibility for the spread of AIDS lies with the church for failing to have the courage and conviction to stand and say, if you want to live in God's world, you've got to live in it God's way. Because if you don't live in it God's way, human stupidity reaps an appalling harvest. And how much we need to proclaim to a world that is desperate that there is a different way to live. You either live in it your way or his way. Because he's not a Christ. He's not a Christ who some can choose and others not. He's the Christ. He's not a way, he's the way. The only way to get to God is Father. And he's not a truth, he's the truth. I have to say that I have a very high respect for the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey. I was thrilled to invite him to Spring Harvest here at Minehead three or four years ago and to have him speaking on our platforms. And I would gladly do so tomorrow. 
I'm thrilled with the determined stand he has taken on so many issues. And I believe that we need to pray for him and be committed to pray for him and to recognize that he is surrounded by different advice. And that doesn't mean we'll always agree with him, but it means we do need to pray for him. But I want to say that having said that, I believe we've got the right to disagree where it's appropriate. I don't say that to knock the Archbishop, for whom, as I said, I have the highest and most profound respect. But I want to say that when it comes to the Church's ministry among the Jews and his refusal of the patronage of that body, I believe that he was wrong. Because those who would tell him that this decade of evangelism should become a decade of renewal are wrong. Every decade should be a decade of evangelism. It's not enough to get renewed, you need to evangelize. And to refuse the patronage on the grounds that it might be offensive to those of the Jewish faith is worthy of human applause. One's not so sure of divine approval. Because if the early church had taken that same attitude towards those of the Jewish faith, then there would today be no church and be no Church of England. And I believe that a failure to evangelize those of the Jewish faith is anti-Semitism in its rawest form. Because it discriminates against those of a particular race and religion solely on the grounds of their race and religion. And I believe that is racist and should be avoided and deprecated by all of us. At the very time when we've just gone through the morass of people telling us that one side is wrong and another side is right politically, surely we should have freedom of speech to speak to those of other faiths and to say if we believe they are wrong. And oddly enough, they actually are quite happy about it usually. And I've stood in the Muslim college and said that I believe Islam is wrong. And I got out alive. I got out after sensible, dignified discussion. We don't have to berate and we don't have to be bigoted. You can actually put an alternative viewpoint, say why you disagree. And brothers and sisters, the day we stop evangelizing those of all faiths is the day we lose hold of the message of Jesus when he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That in itself is not a denial of freedom of speech. A few weeks ago I had the, uh, an odd invitation from uh, Sir Michael Checklin, who's the Director General of the BBC, to go with about 20 other religious leaders, and I say religious leaders, to go for lunch at the Beeb. And he brought out about uh, five of his head honchos, and they lectured us through the morning, and they were going to wine us and dine us at lunch, and and they said about half an hour before lunch, is there anything you'd like to say to us? And they went round the Sikhs, the Buddhists, the Baha'is, the Jews, the Hindus, and there were a few of us who were odd Christians. <laughs> and they went round. And the Baha'is said, well, on behalf of 50,000 Baha'is, we believe we should have more time in religious broadcasting. And the Hindus said, on behalf of whatever it is, 200,000 Hindus, we believe we ought to have more time in religious broadcasting. And the Muslims said, on behalf of Islam, we believe we ought to have more time in religious broadcasting. And there's 500,000 uh, who follow Islam who believe that too. And the Jews said, on behalf of X number of Jews in this country, we believe we ought to have more time in religious broadcasting. And it came to my turn, and Michael Chetland looked at me and he said, well, what do you think? I said, I believe that all of these minority faiths ought to have more time in religious broadcasting. And his jaw dropped. I said, evangelicals believe in justice. And on behalf of 1.2 million evangelical Christians, we do believe in justice. And if X percent of the population follows a particular faith, then surely X percent of, uh, of religious broadcasting ought to be given to them. That is justice, isn't it? You don't look very sure about that at all. <laughs> well, if we're going to have freedom of speech, why not? Are we afraid? If the gospel is the power of God, why are we worried about it? I then said, and of course, Christians don't believe that we are merely a religion. We believe we have a faith that affects the whole of human life. 
So when it comes to current affairs, the news, topical affairs programmes, documentaries and everything else, we believe we need a fair percentage too. And frankly, I'll even trade religious broadcasting for it. Why should the politicians, the sociologists and the economists say it all? When the Word of God has got something to say to our nation, why should we not proclaim it? Of course, there are dangers how you proclaim it. We read that Jesus went about full of grace and truth. A friend of mine, Brian Mawinney, who's Minister of State for Northern Ireland, well, he was. We'll see what Brian is tomorrow. He sends greetings to all of Spring Harvest, by the way. Grateful for the prayers of God's people. But Brian, and it has taught me real grace to befriend a Conservative minister. But <laughs> but Brian once asked you to speak at Stormont for him, and he spoke first, and he said, "Sometimes in the province, when I read of a Jesus who went about full of grace and truth, I think that Christians have more truth than grace." And sometimes he said, "I look at other Christians, and they've got more grace than truth." And Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. Brian said, I believe we need to be full of both, and so do I. I believe we need to be full of truth, but we need to be full of grace and how to express it. When you know who Jesus is, you'll be at the crossroads of life. When you know who Jesus is, you'll know that he is the Christ. Thirdly, when you know who Jesus is, you'll know that you will suffer for him. Immediately after the confession of Peter, Jesus for the first time talks about the cross. He's never talked about it after that. Suddenly he's talking about the cross and the weight of the cross and what it will mean. And poor old Peter, he is stunned. That's not the kind of Christ he meant. He meant the kind of Christ who's going to ride against the Romans. He didn't mean the kind of Christ who's going to die on a cross for humankind. And Jesus has to say to Peter, when Peter dares to disagree with him, Jesus has to say, you're wrong, Peter. And it's Satan using you to say it. Because Christianity is not an easy road. Christianity is not a simple route forward. I hate and detest that prosperity teaching that says you can tell how much the blessing of God is on someone by the size of their house, the size of their bank balance, and the quality of their job. It doesn't match with one of whom it was said, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Nor does it fit with one who to pay his tax bill had to borrow a coin from the mouth of a conveniently floating fish. <laughs> Jesus is not wealthy. Jesus offers you suffering. Jesus offers you pain. Jesus said, let a man deny himself, take up his cross and follow me if he wants to be my disciple. And as Alex was sharing earlier, if you want to follow Jesus in the days and months and years that lie ahead, it's going to be costly, it's going to be expensive, there's going to be pain. But at the end of the cross there is resurrection, and at the end of the cross there is glory. But if you don't have the cross, you can't have the resurrection, and if you don't have the cross, you can't have the glory. And so Jesus says yes to the suggestion he is the Christ. But he also explains that if he is the Christ, then his way is one of suffering. And he calls us to follow him in that same pathway. It was last June. My wife and I woke up one day to the sound of our children crawling over the Welsh dresser and bringing it down, collapsing on them. Well, that's what we saw. We ran downstairs. It was six in the morning, and there was no problem with the Welsh dresser, but the front door looked rather ill. Because someone had kicked through the mortise lock, the chain, and the bolt, got into the house, and taken Ruth's handbag with her birthday money in it. Later that day, while I was at the EA, Ruth rang me up and said, Clive, uh, Chris, our oldest boy, he had been on Clapham Common with his mountain bike, which is the pride and joy of his life, second-hand mountain bike he'd bought himself, and he'd been there with a friend, and they'd been robbed of their bikes at knife point. And I got home later that night, having been up on Clapham Common, trying to help the police looking for the bikes unsuccessfully. And I got home, and there was Ruth standing in the study, and there was a, a hole in the study window where a shotgun, uh, an air rifle pellet had been fired at her, and it had missed her. And after, you don't normally get three in a day, do you? <laughs> after that little lot, Ruth looked at me and grinned, and I said, yeah, we must be doing something right somewhere. <laughs> It's not an easy road. 
easy way. Jesus didn't call us to spend our lives in a big top in mine head celebrating. He called us to spend our lives going out into a real world, confronting that real world with a real Jesus and expressing the fact that he reigns and that he can come and reign in their lives and transform those lives. And if this world doesn't live by his message and by his way, then it will suffer the awesome consequences of choosing their own design because they will fall into the trap of their own stupidity. And we've got to proclaim it, but it will be costly. How much we need to recognize that that's the calling on our lives. Fourthly, when you know who Jesus is, you'll see his glory. Jesus takes Peter, James and John up a mountain, probably Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is always snow-capped. And there up on Mount Hermon, Jesus demonstrates to Peter that he'd got it right. Jesus demonstrates to Peter that he'd been accurate and correct. And what Jesus does is this. Jesus is transfigured in front of Peter and James and John. It's like a light shining through his clothes. Peter saying the story later to John Mark said it. His clothes were whiter than any detergent could get them. And glory shines through Jesus. And Moses and Elijah are there. And you know, Peter had foot in mouth disease. He opened his mouth and he placed his foot in it. And he says to Jesus, Oh, let's make three shrines. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Jesus, you're really with the big noises nowadays. We'll make one for each of you. And he's so excited. And he's so thrilled. Seeing the glory of Jesus, and he, he just gets carried away. He failed to recognize who Jesus is. A few years ago, I had to chair a debate at the Royal Albert Hall between three and a half thousand screaming Muslims and one and a half thousand screaming Christians. Not an enviable task. And uh, the problem with being the chairman is you, you can't say anything except keeping order. What happened was this, during the debate, one of the Muslims said to the Christians, nowhere in your Gospels does Jesus say he was different, he was a better prophet than any other, or he was the Son of God. And they dumped it. They ran away from it. And I hate the poverty of the English language. Because if you read scripture, Jesus doesn't actually say in English that he is the Son of God very clearly. But he does say it in the Greek original very clearly. What's God's name in the Old Testament? It's I am. If you translate that into Greek, you get ego. That's where we get our word ego from. It means I. And you get I me, which is the same as the French je suis, I am. And Jesus doesn't say I me, so and so. Time and again, Jesus said, Ego, I mean. The holy name for God, I, I am. He said, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I, I am the bread of life. He said, I, I am the true vine. They came to arrest him in the garden. He said, I, I am. They were Jewish soldiers. They fell back at the blasphemy. Why do you think they recoiled? They couldn't believe he was saying it. He speaks to a Samaritan woman. She says, when Messiah comes, I'll believe. Jesus says, I, I am. And English says, I who speak to you, am he. <laughs> Jesus said he was the Son of God. He announced he was the Son of God. Peter had no right to say we'll make three shrines. There was only one there in true glory. And the glory the other two had was his reflected glory. Twice in the New Testament, in the Gospels, the glory of Jesus is seen. Once when he's transfigured and once when a man going along the Damascus Road later testified he saw the risen Lord and it blinded him. There's glory in Jesus. There's more glory in Jesus than you'll find anywhere else. There is no one else other than Jesus who is the Christ. When you know who Jesus is, you'll be at the crossroads of your life. When you know who Jesus is, you'll know that he is the Christ. When you know who Jesus is, you'll know that you'll suffer for him. When you know who Jesus is, you'll see his glory. And lastly, when you know who Jesus is, you'll listen to him. You'll listen to him. Jesus doesn't tell Peter off. Moses doesn't tell Peter off. Elijah doesn't tell Peter off. God the Father does. And God speaks from heaven and says, This is my son. Listen to him.
couple of months ago I had a meeting which is recorded in Alpha magazine with David Jenkins, the Bishop of Durham, a man I enormously like and a man with whom I agree greatly on a large number of things to do with social concern and compassion. Don't think this is a knock at any denomination. I could find exactly the same among all the mainline denominations in this country. I disagree with David Jenkins theologically. When I asked David Jenkins a question, I said, you say in your recent book, Free to Believe, that your remarks in the widely publicized television broadcast on 29th of April 1984 were misunderstood. Can we therefore assume that you do believe that Jesus was born without the seed of an earthly father? David Jenkins said no. I said, can we assume that you do believe that the same body of Jesus that was crucified was resurrected, this being the reason that the tomb was empty? David Jenkins said no. I said, so the body of Jesus could still be rediscovered in a Middle Eastern tomb? David Jenkins hesitated and said, I think so. I said to David Jenkins, is it possible to get to God by any means other than through Jesus Christ? So by means of a commitment to other faiths, is it possible to gain access to eternal life? He said, yes, I would think so. In the convergence which is beyond everything, where things come together and the fullness of Christ has spoken about, for instance, in Ephesians 1, you know about the good pleasure of God to sum up all things in Christ. I said, did Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? David Jenkins said, no, John said it. I said, aren't there other ways to get to God as Father other than through Jesus? David Jenkins said, yes. We will meet again in two days' time in a studio at Radio 4 in London where with David Jenkins, Donald Cupid, and a Roman Catholic lady named Lavinia Berg, Ludovic Kennedy will seek to explore whether Jesus rose from the dead, starting from his position that Jesus didn't. And people have said to me, why would you go and actually be part of that debate? The answer is simple. I am sick to death of evangelicals coming together in our holy festival saying, Jesus is King, Jesus is Lord, and not being prepared to say it out there. got to recover the fourth leg. We can't just live on social compassion or even on evangelism and church planting and personal spiritual renewal. We've got to recover our commitment to doctrinal truth and be evangelicals again. And that's what we must recover. Jesus, his father says to Simon Peter, listen to him. You may say, well, I failed so often to do that. I've listened to people blaspheme about Jesus and I've never responded. I've seen, heard his name be dragged through the mud. I've never actually come out and said, there is no other way. When I have, it's been strong and arrogant and strident and it's not got over. What do I do? I want to close with a story. When I was in Israel, I was having dinner one night with uh, a Jewish family. The mother-in-law ran her own flying school in San Francisco. Her daughter was a children's entertainer in Jerusalem and the daughter's husband was a psychologist. And he told the story of how when in San Francisco doing his internship, he'd been seconded to the Roman Catholic Church. And at that time in the Roman Catholic Church in San Francisco, every couple who wanted to get married had to go through six sessions of preparation. Three with every other couple who wanted to get married and three on their own with one of the psychologists. And so this guy, Jacob, said, he said, I was scared stiff that it would happen to me. I would have to deal with one of these couples. He said, I said to them, I said, what can I, a nice Jewish boy, give to this Roman Catholic couple? He said, well, they gave me a couple, said I was an intern, I had to do it. So he said, I didn't know what to say to them. How can I take them to three marriage preparation sessions? So I used the buzzwords that might cause problems in marriage, you know, things like money, sex, mothers-in-law, things like that. <laughs> And he said, after two sessions, I ran out. The third session, I didn't know what to say. So I said, religion. He said, the girl, she said to me, she said, religion? That's a real problem between us. She said, this guy I'm marrying, well, he's really religious. She said, I'm not, but he is. She said, he won't tell me why. And the guy said, yes, he said, I am really religious. I can't tell her why. I'm not a good enough Christian. 
She said, yes, he's ever so religious. Tries to do all the right things, but he won't explain to me why he does. The guy said, no, I, I've not been good enough. I've failed God so often. Jacob said, well, he said, I mean, scratching his head, he could see they were going to war with each other in a minute, and he was going to fail. So he said, didn't this Jesus, this guy you talk about, didn't he talk a lot about forgiveness? The Roman Catholic guy said, yes. So Jacob said, I'll try a bit of psychological therapy. Sit on the empty chair there, look back at the chair you've been sitting on, pretend you're Jesus speaking to you. So the guy sat in the empty chair, uh, looked back at the chair he just vacated and said, well, I came and died for people who didn't believe. I didn't die for the good, but for the bad. I didn't die for the successes, but the failures. And I came and hung on a cross and died because I love you with your failure to serve me. And I want to forgive you because that's why I died. And I want to bring my forgiveness into your life so that you may know you're forgiven and live in me. Jacob said, I saw forgiveness start in his stomach and go up to his face. And his wife-to-be saw it too. And I don't want you to think of all the theological intricacies of a Jewish psychologist and a Roman Catholic couple getting married and everything else. I just want you to remember one thing. Jesus brings forgiveness. And there, up on a mountain, he's... It was a step to go back to glory. He could have gone back. Instead, he came off the mountain. His clothes stopped shining and he went down to a sin-sick world to die for it. And there's something else. One day, your clothes are going to shine too. Because he died, you're going to have glory if you've given your life to him. One day, your clothes will shine and the radiance will be there for you. But you can't, while you're here on earth, live life on the mountain. You have to come down. And in two days' time, you've got to go out into a real world and live Jesus and take Jesus as the Christ, not a Christ. When you know who Jesus is, you'll be at the crossroads of your life. You'll know that he is the Christ. You'll know that you'll suffer for him. You'll see his glory. And you'll listen to him. And for that reason, you'll go out into this world and you will no longer say, he's a better way, but he's the way. Not his A life, he's the life. Not his A truth, he's the truth. And the truth will set you free. Because Jesus is the Christ. There is no other. And evangelicals in the dying years of the 20th century have got to get back that conviction and say with dignity and love to other faiths while respecting the sincerity and hard work of Buddhism, while respecting the intellectual caliber of Confucianism, while respecting the desire for moral integrity in Islam, while re respecting the sincerity of Hindu beliefs, we've got to say with love and dignity, Jesus said more. He said he could introduce you to Father, and that truth would set you free. And therefore, to a dying world, we've got to go and say Jesus is the Christ. Amen.